So let's begin our worship service. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship today. Please join me in our call to worship, which is on the screen. The banqueting table is prepared. God calls us to feast together. Compassion, love, and grace pour out like fine wine. Let us join Christians around the world to share in God's gifts. And our opening hymn this morning is God is here as we your people. Please join me in our opening prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks and praise for calling us together today to worship you as one congregation among many. As we come to your table today, we recognize that here heaven and earth join hands. Around this holy table, we join with your church, which stretches around the world and across many generations to meet you in our midst. As we remember Jesus this day and reaffirm our oneness with him, unite us to those who have served you over the centuries and to all who serve you in so many different situations today. We praise you for your amazing love, which embraces this congregation and invites us into a future you are creating for us all. 
Holy and gracious God, when you invite us to your table, you ask us to come with clean hands and clean hearts. You ask us to come in peace, seeking reconciliation with you and with each other. We confess that we have not always acted and spoken as you have taught us, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have left done and undone, by what we have said and left unsaid. We have hurt others, marred our collective witness of your good news, and failed to share the blessings with which you have entrusted us. Most of all, we have sinned against you. Forgive us, loving Father. Help us amend who we are and shape who we shall be. Free us from the burdens we carry so that we may be a source of peace in this troubled world in the name of Christ, who is our peace. Transforming and renewing God, come to us now, even as your Son came to those first disciples on the shores of Galilee. Speak your peace to our hearts. Touch us with your Holy Spirit. Reveal your word that we may hear your message this day and live as your disciples in the days and years to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, hear the good news. God loves us so much that sacrificing even Jesus, his own son, part of God's own self, doing that seemed wholly reasonable and a wise course of action. Accept the forgiveness that God offers you and live in light of it. Your life made new, your heart made free, your relationship with God made whole. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Our second scripture reading this morning, we are going to read the entire book of Philemon. But don't worry, it's only 25 verses, so we won't be here all day. It is a letter from Paul, a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. To our friend and fellow worker Philemon, and the church that meets in your house, and our sister Apphia, and our fellow soldier Archippus, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Brother Philemon, every time I pray, I mention you and give thanks to my God. For I hear of your love for all God's people and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. My prayer is that our fellowship with you as believers will bring about a deeper understanding of every blessing which we have in our life in union with Christ. Your love, dear brother, has brought me great joy and much encouragement. You have cheered the hearts of all God's people. For this reason, I could be bold enough, as your brother in Christ, to order you to do what should be done. But because I love you, I make a request instead. I do this even though I am Paul, the ambassador of Christ Jesus, and at present also a prisoner for his sake. So I make a request to you on behalf of Onesimus, who is my own son in Christ. For while in prison, I have become his spiritual father. At one time, he was of no use to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. I am sending him back to you now, and with him goes my heart. I would like to keep him here with me while I am in prison for the gospel's sake, so that he could help me in your place. However, I do not want to force you to help me. Rather, I would like you to do it of your own free will. So I will not do anything unless you agree. It may be that Onesimus was away from you for a short time so that you might have him back for all time. And now he is not just a slave, but much more than a slave. He is a dear brother in Christ. How much he means to me and how much more he will mean to you, both as a slave and as a brother in the Lord. So if you think of me as your partner, welcome him back just as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Here, I will write this with my own hand. I, Paul, will pay you back. I should not have to remind you, of course, that you owe your very self to me. So my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. As a brother in Christ, cheer me up. I am sure as I write this that you will do what I ask. In fact, I know that you will do even more. 
At the same time, get a room ready for me, because I hope that God will answer the prayers of all of you and give me back to you. Epaphras, who is in prison with me for the sake of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings, and so do my co-workers Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Now, over the past year and a half, I think it's longer than that now, actually, we've learned an awful lot about connecting remotely with people, checking in with each other, having conversations, coming together without actually physically coming together. We use the phone or a text message, an email or a video call. Who thought that so many of us would become so familiar with things like FaceTime and Skype and Zoom? And we've thought of ourselves, I think, as, as pretty innovative in being a church together without always being in the same building. But the Apostle Paul was doing the exact same thing centuries ago without all of our technology. Paul did it by writing letters. Now, Paul pastored churches all around the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, in, in cities and towns and villages out in the countryside. For many years, he traveled almost constantly, but he connected with his scattered churches remotely from wherever he was with a steady stream of correspondence, letters sent back and forth between his many churches and himself. Even while being held under house arrest in Rome, a very real kind of lockdown, Paul was still writing, still pastoring, and still very much a part of the Christian community in Colossae, which is where Philemon lived. This letter, even though it's probably the shortest one that Paul ever wrote, this letter is a, a brief but powerful glimpse into the kind of Christian community that Paul dreamed of for his churches. As Paul describes how he prays for Philemon, we see what type of person Philemon is full of faith and love for both Jesus and the people around him, and a blessing for the believers who form his house church. Now, Philemon was a fairly wealthy Roman citizen living in the city of Colossae, which by that time was, was still a reasonably busy market city. Philemon was like an elder, one of the leaders in the Christian church in that time, hosting a house church right there in his own home. Now, like most well-to-do Romans, Philemon owned a few slaves, who most likely worked as domestic labor in his household. Now, slavery in the Roman Empire was different than slavery in the Old Testament world, and it was different than the more recent historical kinds of slavery that we are more familiar with. Old Testament slavery was a, a temporary arrangement, usually to pay off a debt or as a kind of social assistance for someone who couldn't take care of themselves. And all the debts and all the bonds were cleared every seven years. Slaves in Rome, though, were very rarely set free, and they were viewed as property by their owners. At its height, about 40% of the total population of the empire were actually slaves, and being anything other than Roman by birth made you enslavable for work ranging from unskilled manual labor to domestic work to highly skilled professionals like Greek doctors and accountants. Now, the wealthy 1% of Roman society owned about half of the slaves. Ordinary middle-class men like Philemon would have had perhaps one or two slaves working in their homes or businesses. None of this is right, of course. It's just the way that the Roman Empire worked. Paul is not trying to change the whole world, the whole Roman Empire, with this letter. What he is doing, though, is taking a small step in that direction by seeking to heal the rift and change the relationship between Philemon and his runaway slave, Onesimus. As we said, Paul starts off his letter by telling Philemon how Paul prays for him, and how Paul thanks God for Philemon and his faith. Paul goes on to remind Philemon about the things that they hold in common, this, this fellowship or a, a joint partnership in the faith. 
that exists between them because of Jesus. And on that basis, Paul makes his appeal to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. Now in the letter, Onesimus is described as, as lazy and useless, and there's a hint that he's probably stolen from Philemon as well. He had definitely run away from Philemon's household, managing to travel from Colossae all the way to Rome, which is about 1,200 kilometers. But because God's great saving plan includes absolutely everyone, even runaway slaves, somehow after that long journey, Onesimus ended up meeting Paul and becoming a follower of Jesus. Onesimus has been a great help to Paul during Paul's house arrest, and it's clear that Paul has become really fond of him and would like to keep Onesimus with him. But that would be illegal and unbrotherly toward Philemon. So Paul writes this letter for Onesimus to take with him to present to Philemon, and Paul sends Onesimus home. That reunion between Philemon and Onesimus would have been incredibly awkward and very challenging, regardless of what was to happen between the two. But Paul wants more from Philemon than just letting Onesimus resume his old work. And what Paul wants is something that is unheard of, completely breaking all the rules of Roman society. Now Philemon would have been well within his legal rights to have his runaway slave killed. Philemon is a good Christ-following man, but our culture, the morality and the laws of our society, those things do have a powerful effect on how we think and what we do. And Roman culture said that that is what Philemon legally ought to do. Now, it would be unfair to speculate about what Philemon might have done had Onesimus simply been recaptured and returned to him, But it says a lot that Paul doesn't even mention that as a possibility, that Philemon might have been considering having Onesimus killed. But knowing that little bit of of Roman law and Roman history helps us understand the implications of what Paul is asking Philemon to do. Paul wants more than forgiveness and letting Onesimus have his old position back without consequences. He is asking Philemon to receive Onesimus back not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. Perhaps, Paul writes, the reason Onesimus was separated from you for a time was that you might have him back forever as a dear brother, part of the Christian community of Colossae, and vastly more to one another than master and slave. Onesimus is to be treated as a beloved brother in Christ before all other considerations, And Philemon, likewise, can be expected to receive the same kind of brother-in-Christ treatment from Onesimus. What Paul is asking for is a a transformation of their relationship from master and slave to the, the same kind of fellowship, the same kind of partnership in Christ that exists between Paul and Philemon. For Onesimus to be made welcome in Philemon's house church as the Apostle Paul himself would be made welcome were he to visit. And one of the unusual things about this letter is what Paul doesn't include in it. In all of Paul's other letters in the Bible that we have, he writes beautifully and passionately and powerfully about the cross and Christ crucified. But not, it seems, in this letter to Philemon. At least, not directly. As Christians together, we talk a lot about witnessing to our faith by the way we live our lives. We talk about learning from Jesus, about learning from Jesus how to think and how to act and what to do in everyday situations and in times of crisis. If we are feeling maybe a little poetic, we might even say that we strive to be a Christ-like presence for others in their difficult situations, bringing Jesus' love, his mercy and grace his compassion and generosity into the lives of one another here at church, but also with our neighbors out in the community. Now, Paul is certainly being a Christ-like presence in this moment, but he's not bringing the Sermon on the Mount or any of the other things that Jesus taught about during his life into the situation. 
Paul is living the cross and what Christ does for all of us through his death and resurrection. So Paul has come to know Onesimus, and Onesimus has become incredibly dear to Paul. So Paul takes the consequences of Onesimus' wrongdoings upon himself. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, Paul wrote, charge it to my account. Welcome him as you would welcome me. You see, Paul is working with a very specific goal in mind, making things right between Philemon and Onesimus. Paul's goal is not to restore the old master-slave relationship between the two men. No, he wants to transform that relationship into what it ought to be, brothers in Christ. So by writing this letter, Paul is acting as a mediator to reconcile Philemon and Onesimus to one another, and he does it not by encouraging them to apologize to each other and forgive one another, not by laying out how they can make amends or compensate one another. He does it by building a bridge between them, out of himself, rooted in the joint partnership in Christ between himself and Philemon, and by taking Onesimus's debt onto himself. This is how we talk about what Christ did for us through his death and resurrection, too. Jesus built the bridge between us and God out of himself, reconciling us, making us right with God. Jesus creates a new relationship between us and God by freeing us from the otherwise permanent spiritual debt of our sin. And Jesus heals what was broken between us and God, making it whole and life-giving in a new way. And Paul is embodying that same spirit of reconciliation by writing as he did to Philemon and Onesimus. Onesimus. What Jesus did on the cross and what Paul is aiming to do with this letter goes even further than that, though. In another letter, you may remember, Paul wrote, We are no longer Jews or Greeks, or slaves or free men, or even men and women, but we are Christians. We are one in Christ Jesus. In this letter, Paul wrote about fellowship, being joint partners for the sake of or in response to Christ. What Paul is talking about is something that these days we call koinonia, and that is not an English word. It is an ancient Greek word, but it's one that we've picked up and used to designate the unique kind of community that Christians form when they come together in Christ. Koinonia is fellowship, joint participation, having shares in the same things. It's being partners with one another in our life together. Christian community is more than friendship, or working together or talking to one another, and it's more than membership, too. It's unity among believers, among us, and between us and God. It's spiritual oneness through the Holy Spirit, and it includes sort of more physical things, too, like sharing resources of food and money and goods. Christian community, koinonia, is expressed in the communion of the Lord's Supper, too, which we'll be celebrating in a few moments. It's the many becoming one in Christ. Now, that kind of Christian community is not without its challenges, and certainly Philemon and Onesimus both would have been challenged by what Paul was asking them to do. We never hear from Onesimus, but I bet he'd have just as soon stayed in Rome with Paul, then go back to Colossae and face Philemon and all the people who had known him only as a not very useful and slightly dishonest slave. But coming together as brothers in Christ equals before God meant crossing over those well-established boundaries in Roman society. And it meant that Philemon and Onesimus both had to leave their comfort zones, doing things that were risky or embarrassing or humbling. Philemon and Onesimus would no longer interact with one another as master and slave. They would have a new relationship, one that would grow from the basis of being one in Christ, making their identity as Christians the most important way that they saw themselves and that they saw one another. And that is one of the challenges of Christian community that we still grapple with today, being Christians together before we are anything else, 
and seeing other Christians that way too. As Christians who are Christian before they are any other part of themselves, as fundamental to them as their sex, their ethnicity, their social position, or economic status. Those other parts of ourselves don't stop being part of us. But if we are doing Christian community the right way, then we are one in Christ together, more than we are anything else apart. And Paul's letter to Philemon also highlights a second challenge of living together in Christian community. And that's what we might have to give up to love someone else. Now, Christianity does value the individual person. We are each of us made uniquely by God, known by God and loved by God too. But from start to finish in scripture, we are urged to put our love of God first and other people second and ourselves somewhere a little further down the list. Jesus' most important lesson, if you recall, was one that he said was the hook on which the gospel and all the prophets hung and that was to love God and love others. That kind of act of love doesn't rest on emotion or getting what we want for ourselves. It's about working for the best for the other person, wanting them to be one in Christ with us, love without condition or any motivation beyond the good of the other. And within a Christian community, that kind of love can require us to suspend our own rights and privileges for the good of another. Philemon, remember, had every right to continue to keep Onesimus as a slave, to demand compensation, to punish Onesimus, even to have him killed. That was Philemon's right and privilege as a Roman citizen and as Onesimus' owner, as appalling and horrible as that is. Now, Paul asked him to set aside those rights on the basis of koinonia, and to welcome Onesimus into the Christian community that Philemon led for Onesimus' good and for the spiritual growth of the community. That setting aside of one's own privilege is a common theme in Paul's letters, where mature Christians, well-established and part of the Christian community, take the hit and sacrifice something to welcome and help a new or struggling brother or sister in Christ. There is a lot packed into that short little letter, isn't there? And it's easy to close our hearts to what Paul's getting at because of the painful and sensitive topic of slavery. Many modern readers do get frustrated with Paul on a number of issues, but specifically here for not condemning Philemon for having a slave or demanding that Onesimus be liberated from his enslavement. But what Paul was aiming for is reconciliation and oneness, a relationship of equality between the two men, equal standing before God in Christ and within their Christian community. And that was, in its way, more radical, more subversive to Roman society than even granting Onesimus's freedom would have been. No longer free man and slave, but brothers in Christ, a new relationship reconciled to one another because of Christ and the cross. Now you might be wondering what happened after Philemon finished reading Paul's letter. It's too long ago to know for sure what Philemon and Onesimus did. We do know that Onesimus, in the company of another one of Paul's people, really did go back to Colossae. It's mentioned in another one of the letters in the Bible. And we know that several years later, there was also a bishop in Ephesus, a neighboring city, and that bishop's name was Onesimus. According to church tradition, it's the same man. Perhaps it's just a coincidence? Maybe. But either way, this short letter is showing us the real and practical transforming effect that the, the many made one in Christ can have the effect that a faithful, loving, nurturing Christian community can have on us all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Sisters and brothers, beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the table that is set is set for all. Around it, there are no divisions. 
Just as one loaf is made from many grains, and as one cup is filled from the fruit of many grapes, so we, though many, are made one in Christ. This is the table of the Lord. Those who wish to serve him must first be served by him. Those who want to follow him must first be fed by him. Come then to the joyful feast of the Lord. Our communion hymn is, I Come With Joy. Be seated. And I invite you to turn to the yellow colored insert in your bulletin that has the responses for our communion prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It is our greatest calling and greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, Lord God, creator and sustainer of heaven. You spoke and all things came into being, the sun, moon, and stars, the sky, earth, and waters, and all they contain. Your spirit swept over creation and brought order out of chaos, life from the formless void. From the elements of the earth, you created humankind made in your holy image. Your breath gave us life, and you called us to live with you in wholeness and mutual love. When we turned away from you, you never turned from us. Through the prophets, you called us back to your ways, teaching and guiding us through your word. In Christ, your word made flesh, you revealed your saving purpose. Again and again, as often as we fall into sin, you welcome us to your side with the open arms of a loving Father. How wonderful are your ways, almighty God, how marvelous is your name, O Holy One, you alone are God. And so with apostles and prophets and that great cloud of witnesses who live for you beyond all time and space, we join with the whole creation to lift our hearts in joyful praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the fullness of time, O God, you sent your Son, Jesus, to share our human nature while being no less God, to live and die as one of us, to teach us repentance, and to reconcile us to you, God and Father of us all. Jesus healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, Jesus fulfilled your gracious will. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. His perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus, we take this bread and this cup and we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice made acceptable to you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, <clears throat> excuse me, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I invite Mary and Susan to come forward and you will receive your communion elements. Please hold on to them until the end and we'll share them together. Take, eat, remember, and believe the body of Christ. Take, drink, remember, and believe the blood of Christ. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you have nourished us, body and soul, in this meal. We have heard your love proclaimed. Now send us out to speak it to others. We have seen your love poured out. Now send us out to show it in everything we do. We have been fed by your love at your table. Now send us out to share it so the world may believe and let all things be done to your greater glory 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Please join me in our words of sending. We have eaten and drunk together with the risen Christ. In Christ we are one. Go then as witnesses of these things. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love this day and always. Amen. Amen.